Welcome to um, the first of these slide presentations I'm going to be doing for you. Um, this one is called Drawing and Seeing. Uh, in it, I want to cover a little bit about the history of, of uh, drawing in, in human history, uh, but, uh, but in Western art specifically. Um, talk a little bit about how our brain works, uh, the relationship between drawing and seeing, and about the emergence of drawing um, as an independent art form. Uh, okay, so let's let's start <laughs> at the beginning uh, with the idea that drawing is fundamental. Um, I do want to emphasize the point that everyone can draw. In fact, it would seem that drawing is fundamental to what it means to be a human being. Now, drawing as an activity. It appears to predate writing as a form of communicative expression. This is demonstrated by the cave paintings. I'm sure you're, you're familiar with, if not these exact ones, uh, similar ones, um, of the upper Paleolithic period of more than 30,000 years ago. Now, these pictograms depicted animals and objects and even employed a degree of imaginative abstraction in order to articulate ideas and concepts that were fundamental to these early people. This is a drawing of a bison from uh, the cave of Altamira in northern Spain, circa 34,000 BCE, so it's very old. Um, now, you may be familiar with how these drawings and drawings like these um, were created. Uh, we have uh, um, uh, 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 you know, evidence that uh, that the, the people who made these paintings were reacting as much to images in their imagination as they were to um, shadows, areas of light and dark on the, on the rock walls of the cave. When you have a fire in the center of the cave, uh, 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 casting shadows on these, you know, uneven rock walls, shapes emerge. Um, and uh, many of the, of the drawn forms uh, coincide with actual cast shadows. So uh, the person who made the drawing might have might have looked at the cave wall, saw a form that reminded them of a bison, called to mind an image of a bison. They would then pick up charcoal, umber, whatever they had to uh, to 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 make drawings, and they would start uh, filling in details and articulating the forms that they were inspired to articulate. From the shadows, or the, or the, uh, in in this case, um, the actual cracks in the wall. Uh, this isn't a shadow articulating the form of this bison. It's actually a crack. You can see the shoulder and the hump of the back of the bison uh, seems to be formed by a crack that was already existing in the rock wall. And what the artist did was uh, 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 one, one, once, once this crack reminded the person of the shape of a bison, the person then continued the drawing of the bison. Now, there's a slow transformation of this kind of symbolic, uh, symbolic drawing. Uh, we call them pictograms, which appears near the end of the Paleolithic period and progresses throughout the Neolithic period. By Neolithic, we're talking the New Stone Age, so a period of around 10,000 years ago. The movement is from pictograms towards writing. This is a unicorn seal from the Indus Valley civilization during the end of the 4th millennium BCE, so about 6,000 years ago. Now, it's unclear as to whether the inscriptions, these symbolic shapes that we see on this tablet, uh, whether they constitute writing, because they're extremely short. But what we do know is that they're symbolic of something. They, 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 uh, they had a meaning, a specific meaning, for the people who created them. Now, moving from drawing towards writing, um, what we see here is in the top column, this is Upper Paleolithic writing recovered from uh, Magdalenian cave sites. And what I want you to look at is the similarity between this. This is, we would, we would call this proto-writing, okay? Because it, it does exist before the invention of any actual alphabets or any actual uh, uh, formal systems uh, of writing. Uh, but look at the, the, the similarities between this and something like this, which is ancient Greek, 
this, which is again Indus Valley, uh, and this, which is uh, runic, probably Slavic runes. So the sketches of these Stone Age people gradually become stylized and simplified into symbol systems called proto-writing, which leads us to some of the first actual written languages, like, for example, cuneiform. Uh, this is around 3000 BCE. We have systems of writing based on these early symbols. They begin to appear across many different cultures. This one in particular is a Sumerian writing system called cuneiform around 3000 BCE. And I think this tablet is a record of uh, inventoried goods. So each of these symbols stands for uh, uh, not only the, the goods that are inventoried, but the amount of goods, the numbers of goods that are inventoried. So what's the point here? Uh, writing is drawing, is it? Well, yes, writing essentially is drawing in the sense that all of the skills required for drawing are essentially the same skills required for writing. The ability to write is fairly universal. Every person with average eyesight and average uh, eye-hand coordination can learn to write, like Anna. Anna is six years old. Anna is able to write legibly so that we can clearly understand what it is she's trying to communicate. So if your handwriting or your printing is legible, then you have everything that you need. You have all the required physical dexterity to draw well. Now, drawing can be defined as the linear rendition of objects in the world. And it can be defined as the linear rendition of concepts or thoughts or attitudes or emotions or things imagined in the world. The important thing here is the linear part. Drawing is description or expression through line. Now we're all, we're probably all familiar with uh, the concept of handwriting analysis or, or graphology. It's considered a, a pseudoscience and it's been debunked for the most part for you know, the last hundred years. Now, the basic claims of grapho graphology are that by examining the physical characteristics of a person's handwriting, we can come to conclusions about a person's psychological state or, or about their personality characteristics. Now, this apparently, scientifically, is not the case. But the idea that the use of line can be expressive, which is at the root of graphology, well, this seems to be true. Take this image, for instance. Handwriting. While it may not reveal your deepest, darkest secrets, it, it can be beautiful, it can be awkward, it can be graceful, it can be clumsy. We, we, can, we can describe it in these ways. What we're looking at here is clearly very graceful, arguably beautiful arrangements of lines that make up this handwriting. Um, here's an illustration of how universal uh, this, this concept is. If I were to ask, if I was to cover up the word happy, the word angry, the word confused, and ask you to label which of these three arrangements of lines represent happiness, which ones represent anger, which ones represent confusion, I'm sure that everyone in the class would agree that this is the happy line, that this is the angry line, and that this is the confused line. So there is something universal about the, the expressive capacity expressive power of line or of drawing. In fact, drawing is one of the oldest forms of human expression. We have, we have evidence of that, um, going back to these cave paintings that we were just looking at. Now, today, we distinguish between drawing and painting, and I think we're correct to do that. Um, drawings can be in color, like painting. They can be made with brushes, like painting, but we usually think of drawing as being made with dry media. But it doesn't have to be. This is a Galileo phases of the moon drawing. Uh, while he may have used a pencil, it looks like he's largely using, um, uh, what is it, like an ink wash or, an, or a tempera wash, um, something similar to watercolor. Uh, the distinction in modern Western art is that drawing, more so than painting, is often exploratory, with an emphasis on observation, we use language around drawing that indicates this. We call preparatory drawings for paintings. We call them studies. And drawing has also been used extensively by the thinkers and scientists of the past as a method of discovery and observation or as a, as a, as a way to articulate their ideas. Again, this is Galileo's Phases of the Moon from 1616.
you know, drawing as art. So again, while painting is concerned primarily with mass and color and value, drawing, while it can reflect similar concerns, and it often does, is still primarily about line. And the thing that distinguishes drawing from other graphic processes that are also often about line, like printmaking, is the direct connection between the process of drawing and the result. Drawing is physical. It's the end product of the physical application of media to a surface by a human being with a hand, right? Uh, whether that surface is paper, canvas, or a rock wall. And we've already established that drawing is, is fundamental and that it's always existed. You know, in the past, it's been considered the basis of all visual art, either through its utility in planning and organizing thought, or in its more ephemeral use as preparation for more involved processes such as preparatory sketches that are, that are destroyed or disappear during the painting process, like this. This is an x-ray image of da Vinci's, um, a painting by Leonardo da Vinci called The Virgin of the Rocks. You can look up the actual painting if you like. The point is, is that uh, here we have a preliminary drawing of an angel holding a baby. You can see the angel's wings. Um, but this is covered up by an area of the painting that is now, uh, there are no figures, it's just a landscape, uh, a section of landscape in the painting. So, so the drawing that, that was done, the preliminary drawing that was done uh, for this painting, at least this portion of it, becomes lost, becomes obscured as the painting develops. So the ephemeral nature of drawing is what we're talking about here, along with the fact that paper was not widely available also made drawing somewhat rare. So some of the earliest Western drawings in existence were made by European monks. They made these illuminated manuscripts on vellum and on parchment, which is animal skins. Um, now up until the widespread availability of, uh, of paper in the 14th century, artists also used and reused wooden tablets for the production of drawings. This is a German manuscript from 1304. Quite an accomplished one. Uh, again, on vellum, this is made on an animal skin, which is one of the reasons why it's so well preserved, uh, uh, as opposed to something that might have been made on paper from the same period might not have survived. Now, it's not until paper becomes widely available in the 14th century that the use of drawing in the arts becomes widespread and begins to resemble our modern conception of the art of drawing. Um, the availability of paper, it coincides also with a shift in values uh, that marks the European Renaissance, in which a new emphasis is placed on individual artistic talent. Drawing begins to shed its anonymous utilitarian status, and it gradually becomes thought of as being valuable as an art form independent of other mediums. Here's an example of a beautiful drawing by Raphael. Um, I'm not aware of a painting by Raphael that corresponds to this drawing, so we can think of it as an autonomous, independent work of art. This is Raphael, uh, a, a man carrying an older man on his back from approximately 1513-1514. So again, back to the question of what is drawing? Well, or what is it the drawing offered the artists of the Renaissance? It can be argued that drawing offers the broadest range of possibilities of all possible mediums. Okay, now through drawing, an artist can depict figures, objects, spaces both deep and shallow, mass, energy, and even motion. And because of the directness or the immediacy of drawing, it can express an artist's personality or state of mind through the flow of the line. Now in that sense, even more so than painting, which I think of as more of a collaboration with the materials. The idea is that, uh, is that um, uh, painting involves chance to a greater degree than drawing does because the material is, uh, is uh, it, 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 it has a tendency to do what it's going to do and you're always struggling against the paint a little bit. Uh, whereas with drawing materials, especially dry drawing materials, you just inherently have more control, right? Because of all these things, drawing can be seen as a more directly personal discipline. Uh, here we have sketches of unusual beasts from da Vinci's notebook. Now you can, I don't know what kind of beasts these are, but, uh, but uh, you could argue that um, 
that these drawings have more to do with da Vinci than they do with the particular animals that are represented. Now, Albrecht Dürer, he said this about his relatively unsophisticated, youthful drawings, that even simple sketches could express the spiritual essence of an artist's creative impulse. And while a talented artist could express more in a simple line drawing than a mediocre artist could in a year of painting. And when he's talking about uh, uh, his, his relatively unsophisticated, youthful drawings, uh, he's talking about drawings like this. This is a 1484 self-portrait drawn when the artist was 13 years old. So, I don't know, you can be the judge of how sophisticated it is or not. I think it's pretty good. Were we going to talk about the brain? Uh, yes, <laughs> we're going to get to that. Um, what these Renaissance drawings are... Uh, th these Renaissance drawings are arguably among the finest drawings ever produced by any people who have ever lived. They involve the careful, illusionistic rendering of objects and figures from observation. But they're made up of lines. Through almost all of the entire development of Western art, we encounter the line as a formal structure. The line is something abstract. It does not occur in nature, except perhaps as a, as a perceived boundary between shapes or colors or planes. Now, in contemporary terms, we appreciate the line today as, a, as an autonomous element of art. It's a form in its own right that can be appreciated independently, like texture, shape, or color. Um, here's one of my favorite artists, is Cy Twombly. This is a a, a, a drawing called Untitled 1970, but it's not much different from his paintings. He makes these large, expressive, gestural paintings of these looping line formations that call to mind writing or, or even more specifically, calligraphy. They're, 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 they're quite beautiful things. But what's happening in the brain of an artist who's depicting the perceived world as an arrangement of lines? Now, I... I don't know. I don't know what it is exactly, but I know that if you step back and you consider what's going on, it's remarkable. Now, the ability to reduce the perceived world of objects and experiences to an arrangement of lines on a flat surface, it suggests a tremendous capacity for abstract thought. But that doesn't mean that the ability to draw is some sort of a rare magical feat. Again, it appears to be a universal human characteristic. Is it any more extraordinary that the viewer is able to decode and identify what's drawn? No. I mean, that seems extraordinary too, but virtually everyone can do that. The interpretation of a line or of a, of a collection of lines as representation of reality is made possible through association. We associate the characteristics of the drawn form with what we know about the world that we perceive. So from the at, at a very basic level, there's a distinction, a thing happening in drawing that's about the tension between what is known and what is seen. Uh, here's a great example of this. This is a, a Leonardo da Vinci. It's a beautiful representational drawing uh, of a sprig of blackberries from 1505. And here we have a photograph of a sprig of blackberry, or more technically, Rubus Fruticosis. <laughs> Rubus fruticosis. Um, now, now, the experience of, of looking at this and looking at this are two very, very different experiences. Uh, and, and when I say looking at this, I mean looking at a photograph of blackberries or even looking at a real sprig of blackberries in the real world is a very different experience than looking at this collection of lines uh, on, on a flat two-dimensional surface. But, however, when we come to a drawing like this, we appreciate its, uh, its accuracy. We appreciate how directly it conveys what it feels like to actually see a blackberry. It looks like the blackberries. It looks like the flowers. Uh, but if, if you really look at it, it's, it's, it's tremendously abstract. So the issue here seems to be one between uh, the activity of drawing and the activity of seeing. Now, I've said before that everyone can draw, but not everyone starts out being able to draw. Let's take Vincent van Gogh as an example. Now, he didn't begin his life as an artist until he was 27. 
And he only painted until he died 10 years later at age 37. So all of the paintings that we know of that we're familiar with by Vincent van Gogh's, they were made in that eight-year period because he spent the first two years of that decade learning to draw. Okay, here's an example of an early drawing on the left uh, called The Carpenter from 1880 and a much more accomplished one on the right from just two years later. This is 1882. Now, when we're comparing the drawings, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's important to look at, at what's wrong with the first drawing. You, you, you can start at the top and work your way to the bottom and literally everything is wrong. Uh, the head, the shape of the head seems odd and the head seems too large for the body. Um, the arm, the bend of the arm here, it, it, it doesn't seem quite right. It certainly doesn't seem natural. The size of the hands, they're too large and they're very claw-like. They do not look like they're gripping that saw properly. Um, he's, he's standing uh, with his weight on either this foot or this foot, but it's difficult to determine exactly which one it is. He, in fact, seems to be floating in space. And you, you compare that to Woman Morning from 1882. She's firmly planted on the chair, proportionately in terms of the way her limbs are bending, uh, the shape and, and proportions of her head, her hands, her arms, where her knees... It, it all seems right. So within a two-year period, he goes from everything being wrong to everything being right. Um, this is most clear in, in, uh, in this close-up of the head of the carpenter. Um, what he does is something that people, when they're first learning to draw, uh, quite commonly do. He's, he's drawn the head of the carpenter, focusing primarily on the facial features that we all focus on as human beings. But what it what it reads like is almost like a mask, okay? Um, first of all, the uh, the facial features seem reasonable. You have you know, the eye, the shape of the nose, the, the position of the mouth, the chin seems a little small, but the skull is non-existent. It's uh, it, it it it's not there. The skull should follow a line about like that. When you look at the proportions of the human face, the eyes generally fall pretty much in the center of the head. Imagine this figure wearing eyeglasses and the, uh, the temple or, the, or the, the arm of the eyeglass extending back from the eye and hooking over the ear. That would be about here. So the top of the ear should be about here and the ear should be about there. So everything is off about this face. But the question is, why? <clears throat> well, there is a reason why. One of the most, one of the most complex things that we do as human beings is uh, facial recognition. We uh, we distinguish between the features of individual people so that we can tell them apart, so that we can distinguish one person from another person, so that we can recognize people that we've met before, people that we know. Um, it's a complex task. And to do that, our brain has to do a lot of stuff uh, that we don't do consciously. It has to do with, with, uh, with uh, observing and comparing individual or, or, or important facial features. And what our brain considers to be important is the shape of the eyes, the shape of the nose, the shape of the mouth, the shape of the chin. Uh, when we look at the human forehead, there doesn't appear to be much information there. So we ignore it. Not only do we ignore it, we don't see it. It's the same as the shape of the skull. The shape of the skull has little to do with the task of recognizing um, a face that we're either familiar with or unfamiliar with. Uh, uh, so in, in, in essence, our brain doesn't care about those things. Here's a painting from 1888. This is a self-portrait, so this is eight years later. At this point, He's got it down. As I said, the eyes are pretty much in the center of the skull. The shape of the skull is articulated properly in a way that looks very natural. This looks like an actual human head. Compare it again to this, okay, which absolutely doesn't. The head, in fact, <laughs> is missing. An interesting thing about this is that he's not only... Uh, articulating what he sees when he looks at himself in the mirror as he's painting this portrait. He's not only able to see more clearly than he could eight years earlier when he made this drawing. 
he's also able to engage with his imagination. Um, he painted himself with cropped hair in this 1880 self-portrait, uh, and he altered the shape of his eyes so that he resembles the monks in the Japanese prints that he loved and collected. I'll show you one of these Japanese prints. You can see the exaggerated and stylized features, the long nose, the tiny eyes at an odd angle. Uh, you can see how he incorporated some of these features into his own features here. Uh, so he's not only uh, uh, developed the ability to draw well, he's also developed the ability to break the rules and to engage with his imagination. So seeing, seeing is very important. What these works by Van Gogh suggest is that drawing is something that anyone can learn to do. Again, I'm going to say that over and over and over again. If you can write your name, you have all the skills in place to be able to draw already. It's not about the physical ability to draw. It really is about learning to see. Learning to draw is more about learning to see. Drawing is a skill that can be learned by anyone with average eyesight, average hand-eye coordination, and average intelligence. Gertrude Stein once asked Henry Matisse whether when he was eating a tomato, did he look at it the way an artist would? And Matisse replied, no. When I eat a tomato, I look at it the way anyone else would. But when I paint a tomato, then I see it differently. So what's Matisse getting at here? Well, Matisse's work is quite abstract. But he continued throughout his life to emphasize the importance of working from nature on drawing and painting what he saw, you know, drawing what was directly in front of him. He believed it was crucial for an artist to avoid preconceptions, the kind of preconceptions that led to Van Gogh drawing incorrectly when he was first learning to draw. So it's crucial for an artist to avoid preconceptions when looking at the world. And he emphasized looking at life with the eyes of a child. Now, this is like the Impressionists, their concept of the innocent eye. He felt that once an experience was named, some of the life went out of it. The Impressionists were all about spontaneity, the immediacy, painting uh, uh, in plain air, uh, outside, in the, in the actual environment with the thing that you're painting and responding to it intuitively. So, in terms of perception, most of us, we think we see things just fine. It's the process of translating what we see through drawing that is difficult, but that's not necessarily true. Your brain already associates much of what you perceive with symbols or with preconceptions about perceived reality. Again, go back to the beginning of this presentation. We were talking about the slow evolution over tens of thousands of years from sketching or drawing from life to representing objects in the world through symbols and how that led to writing. Well, this is what our brain naturally wants to do. It wants to codify everything to make life easier. Okay, so your brain already associates much of what you perceive with symbols, preconceptions about perceived reality. One of the most difficult things to learn to do is to set aside these preconceptions. Now, drawing well requires you to look at a human nose, for instance, and to actually draw what it looks like, instead of drawing the shape that the brain associates with a human nose. Now, this sounds easy, but it's not. It takes work. These symbols represent perceptual shortcuts that we develop early in life as children and that are extremely useful in interpreting the visual information that our brains take in. Okay, Again, shortcuts to help us deal with all of the information that we take in. Your brain doesn't want to work that hard. It thinks it already knows what things look like. For instance, we have Hans Holbein, again, a, a drawing from the 1500s, a carefully rendered nose drawn from observation, from, from, from carefully observing the actual shape and the play of light and shadow of an actual human nose. And here we see a child's drawing of a nose. When the child needs to draw a nose, the child draws a triangle because that's, that's the code, that's the symbol for nose. So are there contradictions here? What's the point here? Matisse, he emphasized looking with the eyes of a child, but we just saw a child drawing a nose. 
with a triangle. You know, Picasso also said, it took me four years to, uh, to paint like Raphael, but it took me a lifetime to paint like a child. Now, the point of drawing is not only to show your subject, the thing that you're trying to draw, but to express yourself. Your drawings are about you. They're intended to express your point of view, to express how you see the world. They're not just representations of the world that you see. However you intend to use drawing, then, it stands to reason that you would benefit from learning to see and to represent the world clearly and to focus on developing those perceptual powers. A creative person is one who can process sensory data and then transform it in interesting ways. Now, drawing can be thought of as a way to gather that data, to explore it deeply through observation and to understand it through reproducing it, essentially. It's a skill that ideally should be in place before the work of transformation begins. And here's a, here's a late Pablo Picasso drawing. This one's great. It's called The Kiss from 1967. He could draw like Raphael by the time he was, how old did he say? By the time he was 13? One day he doesn't say. It said it took him four years as a child to paint like Raphael, but it took him a lifetime to paint like a child. But after a lifetime of drawing, he could draw like this. Again, drawing like a child, the way the child drew the triangle nose in that first, uh, in the, well, in this I'll show you again, the triangle nose that this actual child drew is not far off from the curls of hair that look like that Cy Twombly drawing that Picasso is, is uh, using to depict the hair on the, the man in the kiss. Okay, so what is it that's that's actually happening? These these um, these uh, uh, these symbols that we have um, that uh, that that our, that our brain wants to go to uh, uh, because it's easier than decoding the information. Where do these symbols come from? Well, they come from our childhood. We spend the first few years of our life drawing and essentially developing these symbols um, to help us to codify and understand the world. It seems that it's a uh, one of the primary functions, uh, perceptually, of our brain is to sift through the the uh, the overwhelming amount of information that we're dealing with, almost constantly, right? And to find ways to uh, to uh, to deal with that information um, efficiently. So when we're tasked with, uh, say, drawing a human face, um, and, and we're, we're we're looking at the eye, and we have to draw the eye. Your brain is essentially saying to you, "Oh, don't bother looking at it. I've got a symbol for the eye. I just use this." And now there's the nose. We've got a symbol for the nose. Just use this. And we've got a symbol for everything. We've got a symbol for a tree. We've got a symbol for a hand. We've got a symbol for a table. We've got a symbol for a chair. Our 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 task, the task in front of us, is uh, is to not allow that to happen. Is instead to uh, to take the time to to carefully look at whatever our subject is, whatever it is that we're going to draw, and, and to try to push that, that, you know, that, that language, language-oriented aspect of our, of our brain uh, out of the way and, uh, and uh, draw as though we're seeing something for the first time, as though it's simply an arrangement of shapes and forms that's unfamiliar to us. And that's hard to do. But that's what learning to draw is all about. <laughs> so hopefully, hopefully this class will uh, will help us all get a little bit closer to being able to do that more more efficiently, more effectively um, than we could before before we began. Okay, um, so that's it for this week. Uh, good luck with your with your uh, or you know, have fun with your uh, with your assignment this week. Um, your your contour drawings, your your sustained contour drawings, um, and uh, and I'll see you next week. All right, take care, everybody.